but for me, it's what uh, what I've learned over the years. It's what do you learn from that? So one of the mantras I always do is if if losing a customer, I always try and if it, even if I haven't been involved in the sales process with one of my salespeople, is can we get a call with them? Even if it's a one to one with me, can I get a call? And I want what I try and position for them is, you know, we invested time in trying to win your business. I respect you've made a different decision. I'm not going to try and convince you otherwise, but I hope you wouldn't mind giving me some value in return. I'd just like to learn what we could have done differently for next time. Would you, would you be kind enough to give me that value back? It's a short call and hear from them. You know, is it they didn't get on the sale? Is it something that you didn't realize you were doing? Is it competitors now taking a different position in the market? Is it something your sales individual did wrong or they didn't? Whatever it be. That was Ian's response to my question, which was, how do you deal with rejection when you're a small business, when you were hoping to get that deal? Uh, it might be your first contract with a client. It might be a contract that you were hoping to get and you are rejected and you, you don't get the deal. How do you deal with that? And this interview with Ian is, is filled with nuggets like this, um, some really super solid and interesting advice. I mean, he's been in the kind of sales industry for years in the tech industry, and some of his experience and knowledge is brilliant. But he also says that he learned a lot from other people. Anyway, super interesting listen. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Ian. How are you today? I'm good. Good to be here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. I was trying to think where we last um, met and it was at an e-learning kind of conference day. Um, I even forget the company, actually. Do you remember the company? <laughs> I, I, I don't offhand. And no. the good is keeping in touch with you. And I think the social world means you can keep in touch with people. And a lot of us forget where you met. I've always said LinkedIn should have something on there that allows you to put a note when you connect, when you do the That's initial right. connection to put a note. So you've got that, right? Because we will forget seven, eight years on, you develop relationships and then often forget, where was that first connection? Yeah, it was, I mean, but it was brilliant. It was a big conference and we, I think we sat next to each other and we got chatting about different things. So I'm so glad we've kept in touch or you've kept in touch with me to come sure. on the podcast. I really appreciate it. So I, I really look forward to hearing your story because it sounds super interesting and so relevant for many kind of micro businesses out there and the whole journey that you've been on. So I will start with the first question for all my guests, and that is, can you share with us a little bit about your personal life so people have a bit of context? So where were you born, a little bit about your education, you know, sure. where you now live, and then we'll transition into your first job and then how you kind of eventually got into the world that you're into now. So over to you. Sure. So I, I, I'm from uh, the claim to fame of my hometown is the Titanic finally sailed from there. So that gives a, the clue that it's Southampton. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> it was a good thing or a bad thing, right? But mm. uh, um, and I spent most of my life living in Southampton, but I moved away from there about ten years ago. My family's still there, but uh, I now live in Berkshire. We're working in the IT sector. The M4 corridor in the UK is uh, where a lot, of, a lot of my roles have been over the years. Although, although funny now, I, I now work at a company based in Sunny Croydon, so it's ironic. But right. uh, yes, yeah, so I, I live just off uh, the M4 in Bar Berkshire mm -hmm. uh, with a wife and two two small children, and. Uh, get told I work too hard, work too many hours and stuff. And I think, I think in the, in the world we're in, that's the nature of the beast with social media and uh, technology that it's always following you. It's not the old days that you probably remember where you'd leave your PC at work because it was sort of too big to carry and chain to the desk. That that's sort of right. protect, protected you from, from, from that 24 seven. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I think it said interest and other stuff. So um, outside of technology, uh, which tends to drag you in all the time. I like movies, particular horror movies, and uh, I'm particularly into magic. I do amateur street magic and follow a lot of magicians. And in fact, I'm going to see uh, Jamie Raven, who I, who I know this uh, coming Sunday, in fact, and uh, hope to see him after the show again. So, yeah, so that's sort of a potted summary of uh, where, where I came from and uh, where I so am now. You, so, were you educated in Southampton? 
Yeah, sorry, good. I missed that piece. Now, yeah, so I was educated, and that, how I got into computing was uh, in those days at school there was a small computing lesson. It wasn't the levels you can now get in, in schools. Um, only a few Commodore Pets, if anyone remember them. I think we had three or four at the back of one classroom, and I was hooked from from the outset. So everything then focused around mathematics and English and computing, with the objective I wanted to be a programmer. So right. that's where this that's where this whole my whole career started from is just fell in love with that first computer and the, the wow eyes at anything it could do. And then what did you what how did you get did you get a qualification? Did you become a programmer or Yeah, so I, I then went to college for a couple of years and, and did pro everything around IT, technology, programming, etc. And then um, was lucky enough to secure my first role was at IBM. Firstly Labs, just wow. off Winchester, which is where the cash point was developed and some of the early robotics were developed. So it was in a very high tech location, luckily not far from me in Winchester, Southampton. And uh, so, yeah, I started off as a programmer developer on uh, things like IBM Kicks and GDVM. So the, the back end stuff that no one really sees goes on behind your cash point transaction mm -hmm. and some of the old technologies. Um, and so that that's where... I really got embedded in technology. And then I had an opportunity a couple of years into that where um, was to go into become an inside salesperson at a local networking company who had a distribution right to the Novell Networking, which was the success of the networking world, distributed yes. networking, um, at the right time. Um, so against everyone's advice, including my parents, was don't leave IBM, it's a job for life, et yes. cetera, et cetera. Uh, I took a sales role. Um, How did you transition sales. from being like programming mm -hmm. <laughs> to sales? I mean, that's yeah. a massive jump. <laughs> well, what I saw, what I saw was I was quite ambitious and saw, okay, but my observation at the time, right or wrongly, was a lot of salespeople out there earning a lot of money, company cars, mobile phones, which were the size of a brick at the time. Yes. Um, who were, I could, the capability or, or the ability um, there was an opportunity to earn a lot more quicker and I knew what I was talking about. I was passionate about technology and computing. I could program at that time in nine or ten computing languages fairly fluently, Pascal, uh, Rex, Basic, Fortran, C, etc. So I knew my stuff and I felt, do you know what? I know my stuff. I'm passionate about it. Mm. How hard, how hard, naively probably, how hard can it be? to talk about this stuff and get paid a lot more money yeah. for knowing what you do. So I, I took a role in, in inside sales, didn't know anything about what I was getting into apart from that. I understood technology and, and learned quickly. Yes. And I remember, you know, it was a, here's a desk phone, here's the price book, here's a pad of paper and a pen. There's three salespeople you're going to support. We're on a, an accelerated journey because we've just got this new distribution rights to Novell and it's a, it's a real shiny toy in the market. Mm. Um, help us. And it was really much learn on the job from the people working around me. There wasn't a training course. There wasn't, you know, it was really figure it out as you go, make mistakes. Yes. And learn from those mistakes as fast as you can because we're on a rapid journey. Um, so and, and it was a good learning ground. I made a lot of mistakes. But in, in 11 months, I was through sheer effort more than anything else. I was promoted to field sales. Um, and I remember in those 11 months, I wrote the CRM system in some package I can't remember because that wasn't the days when Salesforce was around, for example. Yes. Um, and we needed something to manage all the stuff that was going on better. And I needed it for the role I was in to know what the field sales people were doing and help my job. So I wrote it in weekends and evenings. I was wow. coding. Wow. So, yeah, so it was a bit of, uh, a bit of both worlds and great learning exercise. But, you know, it's interesting because what you're saying about having to learn on the job, make mistakes, there was no training course. Mm. I mean, that's a metaphor for running a small business, isn't it, as well? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's maybe why I've excelled in small businesses through my career rather than, you know, I've worked in some large brand corporate names. But really, I, I think where my skills come to play and I have the most impact and I shine and I enjoy the most is the smaller company. Mm. Um, and I've done a number of companies over the years now where 
Um, I've, I've done a couple where um, I've for one for a Danish company, one for a US company, where I started the UK operation or restarted it for them, where it was two people and one and five and the other. And they were looking for how do we really build a foundation here? So it's a startup, even though you've got the technology from a foreign company. For the UK, it was a startup. And I've done a, a three now where it's been companies, three or four, where it's been companies of 30 to 60, 70 employees when I've joined. But it's been help us accelerate where we're at. We've been, and companies where they've been in the cloud-based technology, mostly technical-led, um, and they're looking for the business and operational side, how do we accelerate what we're doing? And again, that's a startup mentality of yes. what are all the things I can do to get a better bang for buck quicker? Mm. So I've lived in that world and thrived in that world now for most of my career. It is what are those things you can do? And, and there's, for me, there's never one golden key thing that you come and go oh wow i can just do this and it's a it's a lot of marginal gains it's yes. how do i do lots and lots of small things that nudge this and compound together mm. it's the british cycling team thing i was doing it before but didn't realize it was called marginal gains how do i do lots of small things slightly better the to, combining them together gives that greater outcome the two plus two equals ten syndrome mm. and how where did you kind of learn that i mean so if, if let's let's stick if we can a little bit of chronological and, and i know we will jump out and go to the kind of bigger story of it but after having gone into inside sales then field sales what happened then what did you learn when you were in field sales what were the kind of learning that you had there so, so, so the, the grounding for me was the, the luck I had had with the original three salespeople because they were, and it was, I take it as luck or that I saw them that way or perceived them that way. One was very, very organized um, to, the, to the point of beyond belief. Hmm. I mean, it'd be, it'd be, this was before sat-nav days, to give context. And I remember him having a CB in the car, a citizen band radio, where he'd radio truckers and ask for direction. And it, it was every micro thing. He was so organized, folders with every cuss, everything. Hmm. So it was that, that sort of ingrained being prepared, planned, um, you know, being more prepared than the next person, having all the research. Before you could do social selling and, and stuff you do today, what you know, he did it in his own way, I guess. Um, one of them was very technical. So he earned the respect of customers through, he knew his stuff. He knew the facts um, down to he could get on the keyboard and install Novell and stuff. So they respected him. And the other one, the other one was, and I'm sure he wouldn't take disrespect at this, hearing this if he heard this today, was a little bit wheeler dealer. Yes. Um, he was making deals happen, didn't understand technology, was totally disorganized. You know, I, I, I was that organization piece from his inside sales. Yes. So I had that looking at them of, but they're all being successful. Mm. So I like to think, you know, I've, I've got my technical background. Um, I always say to my teams, you know, one of the things is plan. And in today's world, you've got more advantages to do that if you take them than you've ever had before using social media and social selling to be, be better prepared to win that customer yes. and to service them than you've ever had before, be organized, um, but also have that flexibility of you think outside the box. So rather than wheeler dealer, I take it as being creative, thinking outside the box, hearing yes. the problem, but not having that formulaic um, response. And certainly in, in smaller businesses, you can do that. In, in, the, in the corporate business, that becomes very difficult and regulated because you don't have that remit. You can't walk up to your CFO, CEO, CTO, and have that discussion of how can we do something differently? How can we streamline this for this client? Um, how can we become more frictionless as a business? You can't make those changes. They're pretty baked and you have to just operate within what you've got. But in the, in the smaller company, that's one of your advantages is agility. Yes. Um, so so that, that, that I would say was my learning ground. And then having gone through other startups that I ran myself, where I started, one, the first one was capacity for a Danish company. And I'd never done the startup before. I was a distributor for their technology in the UK. So I got familiar with what they were doing and realized they had a fantastic technology. And, but they didn't have a UK operation themselves. So I approached their CEO from Cold, being a distributor of their products, and just said, do you know what? I know your product. This is great stuff. I could, I could really do some great stuff for you here in the UK. Um, is there an opportunity? And they flew me out to Denmark um, 
And I was a bit, a bit rabbit in headlights at that point of, okay, I haven't been through this before. And I remember them asking me to build a business plan. Didn't expect that. Well, I was there. Here's a boardroom. Um, great. We've met you this morning, a few hours. Give you, a, give you this afternoon. We'll come back to you later on. Give us your business plan. Give mm. us your spreadsheet of what you need, what it's going to cost. And I made it up. I got a spreadsheet out and literally was learning on the spot and trying to be creative of, well, okay, I need a salary and I need um, probably someone in the UK to support me while I'm out on the road. Mm. What's the leanest I can get this and what's the targets I could deliver to convince them to do it, but likewise not to set myself up to fail. There's no point saying I'll do a gazillion dollars. They're not going to believe it. And also, so I built the plan um, and nine months into the first year, we, we, they took me on and we overachieved that plan. Um, and we were then acquired by Computer Associates where I stayed on for three years. Right. So, and most of the, the ones I've been in, I've been through four different acquisitions of four of those companies. Uh, and I'd like to think I contributed, I so uh, I was responsible, but contributed through rapid, a couple of things. One, one is rapid growth of the type of customers we were winning, i.e. winning brand name customers, bigger customers, more efficiently winning them, et cetera. Mm. Um, and also raising the profile of the business, which in today's world is a lot easier than it was then. Yeah, sure. So what I used to do was go to magazines, build, uh, cultivate re- relationships I'd built, get the press release, get re- product reviews done, et cetera. Now on social media, you still do that old stuff, but the game's changed. It, you know, it's about how do you get your message out there? How do you drive customer wins, um, uh, n- interesting things that the, the company's achieved, et cetera. Um, and playing it just to get yourselves known and spotted by your prospective client. Mm-hmm. And that's something I think that's changed the game for small businesses. You, you can make your mark now on a more global basis for relatively low cost as opposed to previously. How would you even attempt that? Yes. And how much was it going to cost? The, the game's changed. The market is flattened. Yeah. Um, if you've got something that's good, whether it be a service or a product, you can now reach the world if you choose to. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. And, okay, so if we look at all of these companies where, you know, you've gone in there and you've almost helped them in a startup situation or at least bringing a startup mindset into it, Mm -hmm. um, would you say those, you know, in order to have been able to be good at that, you need to have had some sales experience in order to do that? I think it helps having the sales mindset because, um, you know, for me, I've, I've got the technical background, but the, the, I've seen a lot of technical people try and if, transitioning into sales. And I, I remember going to interviews on this in the past where p- people would look at your background until I'd had enough sales historical. And go, but aren't you a techie? Mm. Um, and I've, and I've, actually, I was quite proud at Computer Associates when I left uh, after the three years. I remember one engineer saying to me, I've only just found out you're, you're on the sales side of the business. I, cause I used to do demos in the demo center and it wasn't allowed. That was, but I, I understood and learned the technology to the point where technical people, they thought I was one of them. So yes. I take that quite flattering cause, cause I've lost the edge for sure. Um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's the mindset. It's going into it with a mindset of what, there's no barriers um, in today's market. You can achieve incredible things. We've seen that with the disruptive companies who have come at this with anything is possible. Mm. And I think, you know, we, we've seen the Ubers, the Airbnbs, everyone quotes, the Amazons, et cetera, who mm. have come up with an idea. And there's been every obstacle in the world. Dyson's another great example where they've just tried and tried again and been willing to fail, fail fast. But they've got a different mindset. It's nothing to do. Anyone could do what they've done. It's the mindset they've got. It's mm. about being agile, being open to change. And that's one of the mantras I give people now is in today's economy, you have to be prepared to change and change again and change again. Yeah. If you've got that old, it, it isn't broken, so I'm not going to fix it, um, or it's too hard to change, or I'm comfortable with what it is, there's high risk that you're not only not going to be successful, you're going to fail because yeah. – if you've got competitors, they're going to come into this with agility, with new technology, with new ways of doing it and disrupt the market. And we've seen that across all different industries. We're seeing it in retail right now, incredibly. Mm. Everyone's witnessing it. And it's nothing to do with the brand or the old um, providers have done anything wrong, right? No, no, none of us had anything against blockbuster video. Someone mm. just offered us something that was quicker, faster, easier, more convenient. 
And we went to it. Now, if Blockbuster had come out and done that, they had the opportunity to buy Netflix in the early days for, for, for actually nothing, but didn't. Mm. We, we'd, have, we'd have been do, doing what we do with Netflix, et cetera, with Blockbuster today. It was nothing to do with the brand or they'd done anything wrong. It was the company didn't adapt, didn't listen to the customer, didn't think, how can I do something differently? Because it wasn't broken. Yeah. But it was going to become broken because someone else created a different way of doing it. And that's the, the thing I always say to people is you just got to think differently these days uh, and not get stuck in your ways. No matter what age you reach, don't think this is a millennials thing because everyone's changing. You see everyone with a mobile phone, everyone's buying on mo mobile apps um, and using this stuff. This isn't only millennials, right? We're all doing it. Yeah. So we're all as guilty. So whoever your customer is, how could you do something different for them? Mm. Product or service, how, what are other people doing? How do we change? And you might begin, well, we're being successful right now. That's great. How do you sustain the success? Mm. Don't sit on your laurels. Think about all those small things you can do. And it might be looking at changing. Might, well, it's too big to do. We, we've built all this stuff now. Okay. How do you plan to change in five years' time? Do you want to do it? It isn't about doing it tomorrow. It's about doing it before it becomes too late and you're forced to do it. That's what happened with that's what happened with Blockbuster. Yeah. It was by the time they realized what had happened in the market, it was too late to recover. Mm. So I'm gonna come back to the sales question thing, because I, sure. I I hear lots of people, small companies say say, Oh yeah, I can I can start a business, I've got a product or a service, but I'm not a salesperson. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know how to sell. And and that's really why I asked the question, you know, do you have to be good at sales? You're saying it helps, but how do people that have got no no sales experience, but they've got a good idea, you know, they may be a bit technical, um, you know, they may be able to provide a service that's a bit technical, or they may be able to provide a product, physical product that is technical, or a piece of software or whatever. How How can they start, you know, teaching themselves how to become better at, at doing the sales bit? So, so yeah, so, so there's a number of, of, of approaches. One, one is, do you do that in the, in the first place? Um, and if you're going to go down that route, I would encourage you to get some training and then engage with things like the Association of Professional Sales or the Institute of Sales Management, where you can join and become a member in an affordable way and go along to lots and lots of events, webinars, et cetera, because it's all in your membership fee. Mm. So, you know, there's a wealth of stuff there and I speak on some of those and so do lots of other experts, etc. So you get access there, not to just one opinion, but to a whole wealth of opinions and, and membership yes. um, value. Um, it, the other thing to do though is recognize your skills and your weaknesses. That, that's one of the key things is, you know, I, I often watch things like Dragon's Den um, where people go on and they're a fantastic inventor, but they flounder when they put in front of people and, and particularly investors to present their idea and I've, I've often looked at that and thought, why didn't you just get someone to come in who is good at the skill set of putting something across, handling objections and being prepared? Mm. You're the inventor. You'd be there as the inventor. That's your skill set. And you've got your personality and your story to go with it. That's your value. Don't take it away. But don't try and be something you're not. And recognize if you're weak at that and you're not good at presenting. And I, 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 I pain when I see Dragon's Den with something great and someone stands up because I'm not very good at presenting or talking about it. But... <sighs> <laughs> and, and you've just dug your own hole, right? Well, you've yes. recognized it. You've rec even worse, you've recognized that weakness and you've done nothing to address it. You know, so it may be you need to get a good salesperson in who can be that front for you. You know, sales is a very different skill um, to technical mm. and, and inventing and engineering and that side. And it's not to say you can't do both. I've bridged that gap. Um, however, over the years, I've heard so many people say that's rare technical people don't become so it's a different dna now maybe i was born to be a salesperson i accidentally did technical and this was where i should have been in the first place don't know um but that's how i got to where i am but i think that's the thing you've got to recognize it's a different skill set um, yeah. it's a different mentality it's a different drive um you know it, 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 as a salesperson, you've got to be willing to take the, the good with the bad, the knocks, that you won't win everything, mm. and tomorrow be and be particularly resilient. It's in your DNA to do that. If you're going to be a good salesperson, you've got to be punched and get back up again and again and again and learn from it and try and be better next time. 
and win more than you lose. You know, I know, the, and it's it's really interesting you say that, and you know, you got to get back up again because when I started out in two thousand and seven. And it was very early, and it was I was do, I started out doing something that I don't do today at all. You know, I've completely had to reinvent myself mm. at least half a dozen times in terms of what I do today. But I remember it was two thousand and seven. That's when everything started to collapse. Northern Rock in September started to go to the wall, mm -hmm. um, getting a run on their bank, and God knows what else. And then the whole market started getting very jittery. And I just had my first big corporate client on the line, on my fishing line. And I remember they went, oh, no, we're going to make a decision in January. So January 2008, they rang me or I chased them uh, mm. to find out what the decision was. And they said, sorry, because of what, everything that's happened in the market and what's happening, we can't afford it. We're not going ahead. And I took that really, really personally, you know. Yeah. It really almost destroyed me. Uh, I kept going, and I'm still going today. But yeah. it at the time, you know, you do take these things when you get rejection. You do take it personally. Um, yeah, uh, but I think what you need to do, and I've been there and lost lost particularly large deals, which now I look back on and you think, what could I have done differently? But at the time, I, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly if you're bargaining, like that's your make or break of the quarter of the year's number or getting investment or whatever it is. Yes. Um, but for me, it's what uh, what I've learned over the years, it's what do you learn from that? So one of the mantras I always do is if, if losing a customer, I always try and if it, even if I haven't been involved in the sales process with one of my salespeople is can we get a call with them? Even if it's a one-to-one -one with me, can I get a call and I want to – what I try and position them is, you know, we invested time in trying to win your business. I respect you've made a different decision. I'm not going to try and convince you otherwise, but I hope you wouldn't mind giving me some value in return. I'd just like to learn what we could have done differently for next time. Would you, would you be kind enough to give me that value back? Yeah. It's a short call and hear from them. You know, is it they didn't get on the cert? Is it something that you didn't realize you were doing? Is it competitors now taking a different position in the market? Is it something your sales individual did wrong or they didn't? Whatever it be. What can I learn from it? Um, because if you do that, and, and let's say you've engaged in 20, 30 deals, you've won, lost five, what can you learn from the five? Yes. From those five, is there a pattern? Is there, do you know what? Four of them said we lost because of this, a function in the product perhaps, or our, whatever it be, now you can make a decision. Can we do something about that? Yeah. And it might be you can. It might need a gazillion dollars to, to, to be able to develop that, whatever it is. Or it might be, actually, now we know that, we need to address that or we need to, with future customers, look for that earlier and qualify out if that's something. Because if we're going to lose anyway, let's not spend several months and hope and effort of the business on it. Let's identify those earlier based on what we've learned and minimize the wasted time and focus more time on those other customers and perhaps increase our win ratio by one deal out of that mix there because we've got more time to focus on those. But it's learn from it. If well, nothing I, else, I, get something back. The, the biggest thing that you've just said is, you know, ask them um, get, why, you know, ask them the why question. Be brave enough to go back to them and say, just give me, you know, just five minutes or two minutes. Just give me some feedback so I can learn from it. Mm. And you, you're right. I don't even today. I don't do that. Uh, well, I've, been getting insight. I've just taught myself to do it. Mm. And most people engage with you. If, you're, if you've spent time on it and often you've done an RFI or whatever it be, it's a fair question. And I won't say the name, but I did, did this um, in the past couple of years, a couple of years ago prior to this company, where it was a large major name. And you'd have thought they wouldn't engage. And the two senior people got on the phone and spent an hour with me and said, you spent a lot of time investing this, so we absolutely respect your question. And they talked me through why we lost, which was good feedback then to the business of this wasn't the salesperson. We, we, we came second, but second is the first of the losers, right? Um, mm. But we learned from it and got a lot of information. Now, if that helps me then win another customer, okay, we lost that one, but at least we've gained some value back. As a, and I don't think a lot of people do it, and salespeople don't do it, because you move on. You, you take it and say, oh, we lost. Draw a line, move on. That's what yes. people tell you to do. Draw a line. Yes. No, don't draw a line yet. 
Talk to them again first, but oh, tell brilliant. them the context of why you're doing it. Mm. It's not to try and convince you in any way. I respect your decision. I hope you wouldn't mind giving me some value back so I can learn. Think how you'd react to that. Someone's asking you to give the, the advice on what they could have done better. Done in the right context, very few people are going to turn you down, unless it's confidential, typically. I've had a few say, it was a confidential closed bid. We, we can't even give you that. Okay, but very oh, rarely. Yeah. Most people will jump on a phone call, or I've had others where they've emailed me a page or so of notes and everything. Because sometimes they feel guilty, right? They didn't give you the business, but boy, did you try hard, and they respect that. Yes. And they feel, do you know what? I, I can't turn them down. I'm going to give them some, something back. Yes. You and can ask, right? You, you might get a no, but if you don't ask, you don't get, that's for sure. No, but I think it's the way you've posed the question as well. Would you mind giving me some value back? You know, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so I think, you know, it's the way that you suggest how you formulate the question to begin with that there's almost you know, there's no way they're going to refuse and you could actually learn some just invaluable information mm. for the next time you've got to make a bid or an offer or a, yeah, absolutely fabulous. Thank you. That's just awesome. I'm definitely going to start doing that more. <laughs> okay. um, so I love it. Okay. Um, some real amazing nuggets. So what, what, one thing also that I often learn from people is that when they've been on their journey, their career or their business or whatever they've been doing, or maybe even education, sometimes they've come across somebody who has shown them some kindness that significantly helped them on their way. Mm -hmm. um, did you come across anybody that showed some kindness to you on your way that you can think of? I think I've learned from a lot of people. I've been lucky in some of the people I've worked with along along the way in learning snippets. And my advice would be don't don't look necessarily look for one mentor, um, but but look for multiple or nuggets. It's that's again marginal gains. Um, don't look for one person who's gonna tell you everything you need to know and you're gonna copy them and learn everything from them. Take little things, and I'm doing it today still. So, you know, I, I've got lots of things, um, phrases that I use that have come from people along my journey. So one is don't boil the ocean. One of my old bosses, glo global head of sales at, at the time at Computer Associates, the one thing he kept that into me, and it's ingrained, and I say it now and do it without even thinking, it's in my DNA, is don't boil the ocean, is what's the most important? Here's 30 things we need to do. Okay, what are the top three that can have the most impact? Get them done. Because if you don't, if you don't even do the others, is it going to have an impact? There's the number thirty may need ticking at some point, but is it going to seriously impact the business? And if you can do two or three that double your revenue, an, an extreme example, are you even going to care about number thirty on the list? And is anyone even going to remember? Yeah. But, but you know, and I used to be of that ilk, and I still work hard and long hours and try and get everything done. But I was of that ilk where he'd catch me and go, "You've got too much on your plate." Mm. I do this thing, that, you know, and he helped guide me and even pick them out at times, going, right, those two or three things there I need doing, can you get them done first? Forget everything else and I'll protect you. Anyone else comes to you about any of that other stuff, yeah. don't matter, just send them to me because mm -hmm. I've told you, you can say explicitly, I've told you to get those done first. So I had that shield around me for that focus. Um, so that's one. Uh, marginal gains I sort of picked up myself, but... Um, and knowledge is power is, is a phrase that used by lots of people, but is be prepared. So there's all these little snippets I pick up from people around me. And also get on calls with people, it, it, you know, listen in. And I listen to my team. It's not just about coaching. It's about listening and learning. How do they phrase things? Because everyone that you engage with, whether it's an employee, a colleague, a customer, has had different life experiences and job experiences. Yeah. And they've all got something where they're better than you at it. But what can you plagiarize from them? And I think that's <laughs> the key, isn't it? You know, it's not that you're getting published or anything. Plagiar plagiarization is a smart thing in that respect. If, they're, if they've got a phrase they used, um, like I picked one up and you just listened and picked that one up, so that's useful. If there's a phrase that they use, listen to podcasts, join, you know, the ISM, the APS I mentioned, the sales associations, you know, if you listen to all their podcasts, their webinars and things like we're doing now and you listen to this one and you pick up one snippet, 
That's all it takes. It isn't about listening to something for an hour or going along to a day's event and coming away with 400 things and it's changed your world. It's coming away with two or three nuggets or snippets of how someone said something or a technique and picking up that one. You know, I've taught my team something I learned years ago, something I learned through my experience at Rackspace. Let's go there. They use NPS, Net Promoter Score. And that's now ingrained in me. I use that in the sales process in a very fundamental way of get ask the customer. When they, you ask them, what do you think? That has no value. It's great. No, what you want to ask is, would you mind if I said zero, this isn't right for you? Or it's, it's really not the best you've seen. It's the worst you've seen. And 10 is, this is the best thing that could change your, change your life and your business. Mm. Where, where do you think we're at? Where do you think we're at right now? Could you give me a rough idea? Mm-hmm. Because then you've got a gauge on it. If they say it's seven, well, I think you're about a seven. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for the feedback. Mm. What would it take to be an eight? What what other things would, would you need to hear from you to be an eight or a nine? Mm. Mm. It's really basic, but I picked that up from hear, hearing how net promoter scores used in surveys, right? We all do it. Someone says zero to 10, would you recommend you to a friend or a family? Yeah. I've just taken that little snip and tuned it. Went, actually, that's really smart. So it's all these nuggets of small things. They're the things that you can employ really quickly that don't mean you need to go and spend a fortune, don't mean you need to change everything you do. Can you find lots of nuggets every day, every week, something new that's small that you can apply immediately and start using and become habitual in your process? Because every one of those will add up and compound your success. And also people need to be brave, right? Because Asking people, where am I out of 10, is mm. quite a scary thing to ask someone to say. Because, you know, if they're going to say, well, actually, you're a three, you know, you're going to be like, oh, blast, that's really bad, <laughs> you know. Um, but, 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 Michael, would you not rather know that than what you get with a, with a different question is, and what do you think? Oh, it's good. No one's going to say to you otherwise. You're not contexting for them. Mm. You're not giving them that open opportunity to give you something you can judge. Where am I in this? Um, and if they say a three, fantastic. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Can you help me understand why it's so low? Perhaps I've not shown this in the best light. That's normally not what we hear. No. Perhaps this is the right solution or service for you. Mm. Can you help me understand why you've given it a three? And it's given new conversation and maybe they'll explain something and you may decide actually we're not right for you i I misunderstood what you wanted to achieve or do here Mm. but now you're exiting as friends thank you very much they're going to respect you for you're not now wasting the next month doing more meetings from hoping or or calling them the worst is you keep calling them and they're not responding yeah or you're getting that email where you don't get a response well guess what they're probably not interested, but you don't know because you didn't get the feedback and you didn't give them the opportunity. I think it's good to give people the opportunity to tell you it's bad, but mm-hmm. in, a, in a soft way, because they're not going to tell you to your face, I don't like it. It's very rare you get that, right? You might get it from a Yorkshireman or something, but generally <laughs> when you say, what do you think? They go, oh, that's not bad. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's yeah. an easy question, right? It's a soft answer because they don't want to tell you to their face. Mm. That's right. If you're in an interview and, and, and where do I, you know, it, oh, oh no, we need to see more candidates. Mm. Really? Or does that mean you just didn't like me and I'm not right for the role? Mm. Now, where, and I do this in, inter- I've done this in interviews as well. I NPS score them. Use it again and again. Just soften it. Hope you won't mind me asking, but Please do give me an honest answer so if you, and, and context it and then go quiet and let them answer. And why is it called? We all do a, it. It's easier to write. Why is it called a net promoter score? It, it's, it's a net promoter score methodology. It's nothing to do with sales. It is where you see um, people do that zero to 10. Would you recommend? Yes. And often it's at the end of a call or a survey or a web, you've bought something. There is a whole methodology around this called Net Promoter Score, founded by a US guy. So if you look on a lot of corporate companies, they'll actually publish their Net Promoter Score. So it will say, out of all the customer surveys, here's the average we get. Mm. So it's an official thing. All I've yeah, done is adapted do for just day to day, right? Just do it in front of, yeah, just do it in front of someone and ask them. Don't make it official. Don't call it Net Promoter. Just ask them out of zero to 10, what do you think? I mean, it's a brilliant, brilliant question. And the thing is, people that do coaching, you know, they do coaching of people to try and get people to a better place. They always ask, you know, out of 10, where do you think you are? And then after they had the coaching session, they go, right, after this session, where do you think you are out of 10? 
and yep. it's it's simple for people to to do that, isn't it? It's not difficult at all. So, Again, that's what I like. Lots of simple things that you can choose to do or not, mm. but you don't have to spend money on this. You don't have to, There's lots of small things you can do and learn from people around you and these different things. And I'd yeah. encourage people to get on podcasts like this. And it's about getting nuggets. If for 30 minutes you listen to something, and you get one or two nuggets you can now use in your business. Mm. You are now better than you were yesterday. Yeah. For very little effort. So question that's on the tip of my tongue for you and i'm going to ask it now and that is having been in such a rich kind of technical sales career that you've been where do you see the future particularly around ai in terms of how sales might be automated uh people might you know sales teams might get reduced as a result of artificial intelligence, et cetera. How, how do you see that happening over the next five, 10 years? Michael, that came out of the sidelines and as a question. So interesting, I've, I, I've been at a lot of conferences talking about AI in general and yes. from the sales side and I follow technology because AI sits within the area I'm in, which is cloud and so does big data and virtualization and VR and et cetera. Um, it's going to have an impact, right? And it certainly could have an impact where you can, like the Amazons of this world, can scale something on an autonomous basis, i.e. Um, Amazon, we've all fallen into right because we typically you can research what you want now you don't need to touch and feel it mm. um they're fast the delivery's tomorrow it's one click etc and the chatbots they have on there and their 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 business is based around being efficient and cost effective if they were five times the price of the high street they would not be where they are today right but typically you can find a comparable if not cheaper price there quickly yeah. and get it shipped and when you have a problem you can deal with it quickly so they've removed the barrier to deal with them and the, of the comparable the shops would say well you've got to come in physically touch it yeah to a degree some things people do yeah. but um they, they've removed that so where does ai fit i think it's going to help businesses such as that and those that have a consumable product yes um, automate where you're selling something that is high value or personal so if it's i'm selling sales training you, we, as, as it came up on the line Really, you're not going to automate that and deal with a bot to give it because it's fluid, it's people business. Mm. If it's an enterprise technology that you're going to spend millions on, yeah. you're not going to do it using an AI bot online. What you might do, though, is interact with that company in terms of finding out information. So the yeah. chat bot they have might be AI, for example, so that they don't. So therefore, they can serve you 24 seven then. Yes. instantly as opposed to maybe different hours that you'll find or it could be with support mm. that they can better handle support and either say well we're not charging for support anymore because we can we've still got operators but 60 percent of our calls we can now handle through an ai bot that uses the knowledge base mm. to walk the customer through questions and it sounds like they're talking to someone but it's all automated yes. therefore we can afford to give free support because we don't have to hire as many people as we had before so it's going to have an impact on Businesses' interaction with customers is it going to replace salespeople at ad, ad finitum and ad you know whole? I don't think so. No. People, it's a people business, right? People buy from people, mm. um, and the more you're spending, the more you know. Car dealerships, you can buy cars online. Yes. How many of you walk into a car dealership right now? Why? Because there's the comfort of seeing the product, asking questions of a human being, because it's a big purchase, and knowing if there's a problem you can go back to them sort of thing after sales service and all the rest of it. Sure. Is that going to be replaced by a bot to sell you the car? No, it may be replaced by a bot to talk about the car when you're doing your research. Mm. So I think there'll be less sales jobs across the board because of a lot of those more generic stuff that humans have to do today can be automated. Yeah. But, but you're not going to replace all salespeople is my belief. Now it's open to opinion, right? And, but I think we talked about this with lots of things years ago. Robots were going to replace everything. They still haven't. Mm -hmm. No. AI, AI is getting rapidly better than it ever was because of the, the consumerization using cloud technology is making it more affordable mm. and we're accelerating its capability with compute power quickly. Um, but we're going to see it. We won't even know it's AI, right? We, the, the idea, the perfect AI is you don't know it's AI. You think you're talking to a person. That's right. the reality. That's what we're trying to get to. Yeah. So it's going to have an impact, but you could also argue, well, are those jobs going to change? And where we 
where we've closed down some jobs, new ones will open. And we've seen, we hear that all the time, that if you look at the job titles in technology, for example, there's lots of job titles that didn't exist 10 years ago. Data scientist, yes. social media, you know, all, all those didn't exist. So whilst some jobs will go, I think it will also create new ones that today we maybe haven't even thought that will exist. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's also imp it's in, an important topic and um, people that are, you know, starting their business or are, have a small business, they definitely need to be thinking about it, right? Because you don't want to ignore it. You need to kind of, um, you know, even if it's having a little plug-in on your website where people can ask questions, that at least you get an email immediately. Yeah. You know, there's like a little bubble that comes up when people go on the website and they can chat to you kind of live almost. Well, you need to think about your buyer persona in my view. It depends what you're selling and who you're selling it to. Who is your ideal customer and how do they want to interact with you? And what's your differential going to be? Who are you up against and what are you going to do differently? And the difference might be the product or something you've invented or the technology. It could be the service or how you're delivering that product or service. Yeah. But what's different? Because you can be small but be and that can be part of your advantage because you're agile, you react quicker than the giant goliath that's out there yeah you can go and buy it from them but your service you're going to get and maybe it is you address other small businesses or micro businesses because they're not getting good service from the huge corporation mm. and you can be there that could be your differential and your value it's finding who, who is your customer what what do they need that they're not getting today that you could deliver and how do you deliver it differently yeah. and that, that will carve out your market and your business if it's i'm a me too and i've got no difference and no value to them, and I don't know who my customer is, yeah, you, you might be able to sell some stuff, but how sustainable is that going to be? And I think it's you need to step back and understand going into it, who is my buyer persona? Is it uh, millennials? Is it um, old age pensioners? Is it um, females between this age and this age in, in this sector or this area or with this business need or their mothers? Newborn mothers is because of the products I've got. Who is your dynamic? How do they research by? Where are they? Which social platforms? How do they interact with things? What works? Yeah. And then utilize that. Don't try and boil the ocean and be everything to everyone. Don't try and be on every social platform just in case. Where are they? If your customers and your buyers are all on Instagram and your product is pictorial because you're a great artist, mm. don't worry about having sites on everything and trying to manage 12 different multi-omni channels to you. Do the one that's going to get you the most bang for buck and do it really well. Yeah. Brilliant. So, Ian, um, tell us a little bit about what you do today then. So I, I know you've got lots of fingers and lots of pies, but let's talk about like 80% of your time. <laughs> sure. In terms well, of what most of my time it is my day job, right, which is sales leader, director at uh, cloud telephony provider Natterbox. And we, we've built a phone system in the cloud inside Salesforce. Um, we're a worldwide first, we're doing lots of firsts and unique. But, but there, there's a good example. Our buyer persona is a Salesforce customer. If you, if you haven't got Salesforce, we're not about to get Salesforce, you're not the profile customers. That's the first gate we look for. Mm. Then it's, do you care about customer experience? Do you care about the efficiency of your sales? So there's gates we put people through to qualify. Are we right for you? Because we're not, no, no, nothing in the world is right for everyone in every instance. Mm. So that, that's the majority. That's my day job. That's what pays me. Outside of that, I'm non-exec on a number of industry bodies, Cloud Industry Forum, Federation Against Software Theft, and non-exec on a number of companies, for example, a GDPR training company, Sure Data, um, a social selling company, Digital Leadership Associates, and Cranford Group, which is a cloud skills um, resourcing. So they provide skills on AWS, Azure, etc. And my involvement in those is giving them advice on the stuff we've been talking about, mm. just giving them guidance of it's that outside mindset of what should you be doing differently that can make a difference. And a lot of it is marginal gains, etc. And I've done a lot of um, ad hoc advisory for companies rather than be, being a non-exec. And all I look at is, and, and all, what I'd say I bring to them is, I've got different background and experiences. It's simply that. You don't know what you don't know, nor do I. So I'll spot things. You're, a, you're too close to it. And B, you just haven't been in the environment to experience it before. And I've been lucky enough to have gone through that and that before. So I'm going to say six things that to you might sound, wow, 
But to me, they're just because I've done them before. I just the luck of the draw is I've done things that you haven't. So you, and you'll you'll have done things that I wouldn't have thought of. Mm. That's just the world. Um, so I have that. So that's where I t- 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 tend to give advice. And I, my, my big mantra I've reinvented myself, and that's that learn and change and change again over the past few years is social selling. Yes, it's learning how to use social media in your business to your advantage, and that isn't just setting up an account and posting lots of stuff and hoping. Mm. It's it's a methodology. It's not. It's not technology or product. It's a methodology of thinking of how do I get to engage? How do I get to be a thought leader in what I want to be known for? Mm. Um, and it's interesting. It can be fun as well. Um, you know, I'm now on in the cloud space. Um, and lots of reports. I get to do lovely things like I'm doing with you here. I get to write. I'm, I'm a uh, a blogger for Oracle and I've done stuff for Sage and for SAP on invite. They reach out to me. Can you do something? Yeah. Um, but I've done that over the years. It hasn't been a, I've done something and in a month's time it happens. Right? I've progressively looked at that's my interest and passion. That's what I want to be known for. Yeah. And it's what do you want to be known for? And then it's, there's techniques you can use that if you continue to do and you know what you're doing and you've got a, a, a good voice, maybe it's blogging or whatever, you can get known in the sector you want to get known in. Yeah. Wow. Sounds fascinating. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you've given us such amazing nuggets and definitely loads of nuggets in this podcast. So really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And, and what, I mean, do you see you're going to be with this company for a while or do you see something else that you're going to be heading towards? That's or? the intention. Yeah. <laughs> it's always the intention, right? And, and But I've been through quite a few acquisitions. And, and when you work certainly in an innovative space, yes. that is always, you know, customers of that work, you, what you've got so incredible. And I've had this year on year in different companies. You know, you're going to get bought. My answer is always everything is up for sale unless you're at the top of the chain like an Apple. Yes. Yes. Um, or Google, where it's highly unlikely because there's very limited, there's limited on the planet, if any, that could afford to do it, yeah. then you, you are always up for sale, even if you're not intending to be. Because if someone came along um, and wanted to, you know, we see it all the time with acquisitions, you, you go, wow, I remember when HP bought, bought Compaq, and everyone's like, whoa. And we see it all the time where companies come along, you know, um, Facebook bought uh, WhatsApp, bought Instagram, et cetera, for incredible amounts of money mm. but they weren't on the market gaming for that they were on the market too how do we grow a successful profitable company mm. and make it as big as it can be mm. so you know that often changes that dynamic is something comes along and buys it and then you find out the good the bad and the ugly sometimes those work well and i've stayed with companies i've been through two acquisitions where i stayed three years and five years and i've been up through others where it just hasn't it being fun anymore. It's not what I signed up for. And after a year, you, you leave and find something that is more your ilk. Mm. And that's just the nature of an acquisition. But we're not under acquisition. Right? At the moment, yes, my, my for my long-term foreseeable future, and I intend to continue the success we're having at Adabox. We're growing at an incredible pace. Um, we're transforming lots of businesses and how they interact with customers and customer experience over the phone. Um, and we've got lots of new stuff coming out, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, so that, 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 that's that's what I intend to continue, and, and I'm passionate about it. Right, cloud. Where, where I'm involved in a technology that is at its early part of the market, it is not saturated, and we're changing. We're doing stuff that is innovative. Mm. That's fun and interesting. Where where I tend to want to be exiting is where either it's now a different company and it just doesn't fit culturally, or uh, do you know what? It's a saturated market. It's done now. Yeah. So I was in the email filtering market for years, and that is just saturated. It's built into your mail product now, mm. um, and there was everyone did it, and it just became a commodity. Yeah, that's that's not me. It's not carving out something new with customers. It's just selling them something that they're going to buy yeah. from someone anyway. Yeah. So I mean, you enjoy the kind of whole startup sector, don't you? And and mm. have that sales approach and newness and growth. In, in a new sector and a new company, um, which is fabulous. And yeah, lots of lots of people can learn from your experience. That's amazing. Thank you. Well, they can learn from everyone around them. Right? That's the key, I think. Yeah. I'm still, I always say to people, I'm not baked yet. I'm still learning. It's of having course. that mindset that no matter what you've done, how successful you've been, what experiences you've had, 
still learn, go to, go to events, go and go on to webinars, podcasts. Mm. And even if you get one little nugget of information, you're better off than you were before. And do something with it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And tell us, how can people get in touch with you and where can they locate you online? Sure. So I'll give you another nugget there as a hint. Um, so in, in terms of your personal profile and whatever, so I've made it easy, right? So if you want to find me on LinkedIn, if you go to www, I shouldn't even need to say that now. Sure, I should no, know that by now. No. Um, but if you go to Ian Moyes, dot co dot uk that will yeah. take you straight to my linkedin profile and if you go to ianmoist.cloud it will take you straight to my twitter profile so oh. you only have to search just put that in yes yeah, so, and that also helps indexing in, in search engines by the way so you know for a 15 pound 10 pound whatever it is a year to buy your own domain and then i just fronted it a couple of clicks in it's fronting and redirecting to those sites for me and there you go it's a very simple thing again another one of those little snippets that through no hardly no effort or cost you could just do something different, make it easier for your audience, your customer to find you in every way. So it's ianmoyes.com and ianmoyescloud.com. .co.uk, they failed. ianmoyes.co.uk. Yeah, sorry. And ianmoyes.cloud. ianmoyes.cloud, okay, right, got it. So I'm going to repeat it one more time, ianmoyes.co.uk and ianmoyes.cloud. You got it. Brilliant. So they'd be able to get you on those domains they Fantastic. Well, I, I've remembered also where we met. It was at one of the Connect events with Artisan Solutions. Oh, you're right. There you go. Well that, done. That's where we go. met first. So it's, it's a few years back. I just, mm. they've got an event going on this year. So I might, I might go to it. I'll have a think. There you so, go. Good. Ian, have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And hopefully we'll meet in person again very soon. Look forward to it. And thank you too. Appreciate it. Take care and all the best. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 